Welcome to Cornwall, a gorgeous county found at the far end of the British Isles, known for its stunning coastlines, beautiful beaches, tropical plants, chocolate box towns, but also a great food scene. If you're joining me for the first time, hi, I'm Caroline, and in this series I've enjoyed exploring all of this and so much more. Along the way, I've needed food for sustenance, and in today's episode, I'll be working my way through a list of traditionally Cornish foods, exploring the history and origins, as well as trying this stuff for myself. If during the video you find yourself enjoying it, please consider giving it a like and subscribing so that you can join me in my adventures. The traditional English cream tea. Never was there really so much of a fallout and argument across the nation as to the deal with the English cream tea. So for me, I grew up in the Northeast, therefore I call it a scone. However, living now in the South of England, I get severely mocked by usually my students for saying scone, like miss it's scone. And then there is the age old argument between Devon and Cornwall as to whether it's cream first then jam or if it's jam first and then cream. So whilst being here in Cornwall some may argue that I am committing sacrilege but I've decided to have one half of my fruit scone with the cream first which I will hold up my hands and say that is normally how I have it. I just find it much easier to be able to spread the cream on first when there's no jam on there and then I put the jam on top and it seems easier to spread jam on cream than the other way around but because I'm in Cornwall today I am deciding to also have the other half where I've gone jam first as per the Cornwall way and then I have struggled a little bit to dollop some cream on the top but I feel like I've done a better job of being able to spread that cream than what a lot of the I suppose PR photographs advertising the Cornish scones look like because I've always found them to be jam all the way out to the edge and then you've just got a huge dollop of clotted cream in the middle and in my mind I think well, that's going to be awful because all you're going to have is just the taste of jam in your first few bites and then when you go into the middle it's an overwhelming taste of the clotted cream so I'm hoping that this might be a little bit better than perhaps the PR photographs are made to look. So I'm gonna go with the Devon way first, in part because I've had it this way before and I kind of know what to expect. And it's a great scum. And it's not overly moist, but it's not too dry. And you've got the raisins in there that give it a little bit of a slight different sweetness to the strawberry jam. And then that clotted cream, it just kind of melts almost in your mouth. I really, really like it that way, just because of how even it all is. You don't feel like you've got too much of one thing or the other. But now, because I'm in Cornwall, I'm gonna try it the Cornish way. <laughs> that was a big mouthful there. And when you eat into it, you definitely get the taste of the clotted cream much more quickly. And then you've got to sort of work for it to get the jam. I feel like because I'm here in Cornwall, I need to be saying that I prefer the Cornish way, but I don't. I definitely prefer the Devon way. I prefer having the sweetness of the jam first and then you get through to the meltingness of the clotted cream. I think I'm gonna stick with the way in which I normally make it, the Devon way, I'm sorry. Yarg cheese is going to be the next thing that I try. It's been a recipe that's been around since the 13th century, but there are a couple of farmers who are right on the edge of Bodmin Moor here in Cornwall called Alan and Jenny Gray, who are the ones who now make the Yarg cheese. Yarg isn't actually a word that comes from the Cornish language. Instead, it's just their last name of Gray, spelt backwards. One of the unique things about Yarg cheese is that it's wrapped in nettles. The nettles are picked locally and then they're frozen, which takes away the sting. And that's why I can pick up and touch the nettles without really dropping the cheese because I'm in so much pain from the stings. The nettles, 
I've also helped to give the cheese a little bit of a unique flavour as well. Now when we went to the shop to purchase this, the lady asked us how much did we want and our response was, well we're not really too sure because we've never had yarg before so we're not too sure if we're going to like it or not. And the lady who was stood next to us in the shop said, oh it's delicious, if you like Wensleydale cheese you'll love it. At which point we said, well we really like Wensleydale so go on, we'll, we'll, we'll take a, a decent wedge of it. But my research online has actually said that it's a little bit more like Caffili cheese. Set myself up with a bit of a cheese board for dessert. We've got some crackers and some fruit, some apples and grapes which complement it quite nicely and some wine which is definitely not Cornish, it's more, it's not even English or British, it's Spanish but it goes quite well with cheese. I'm not much of a wine drinker, especially not red wine so we'll see how that one goes but I'm definitely eager to get dug in and try some of this Cornish yarg. That is a lovely, lovely cheese. I would say that the texture is not too dissimilar to a cheddar. So it's not a super hard cheese like a parmesan, but it's definitely not a soft melty cheese either. It is not strong at all. Definitely not mature. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, I'd say it's not too dissimilar to a cheddar. But there is definitely something to it that just gives it a slight tang and I'm guessing it's probably the nettles but oh I'm really pleased we went for a, a big wedge of it because I know that I'm definitely going to be able to get through all of this. Might as well try the wine. Actually in fairness I'm not normally a fan of red wine but I think when paired with the cheese and the crackers and the fruit that's actually really nice so I think I'll just keep on going with all of this. Cornish ice cream is quite unique in that it uses the clotted cream that is used in the scones when you have it with clotted cream and jam. It means that you get a ridiculously rich flavour to it. We've come along to the St Ives ice cream which currently is one awards, I'm not too sure which ones they are and unfortunately because it's a really hot day we've already had to start digging into this but I've gone with the white chocolate and raspberry ice cream, salted caramel ice cream as well. Oh yeah, we did that. And yeah, it's just as creamy as what I would have expected for Cornish ice cream to be. It really is down to that clotted cream. And the raspberry and white chocolate is really nice because you've got the ridiculously sweet bit of the white chocolate. And then you've got the slight bitterness or tartness from the raspberry. And then the salted caramel. It's just great. It's really sweet. And then you've got that salty kick to it as well. But anyway, as you can see, it is very much melting right now. So I'm just going to have to quickly keep on eating this. Heather cake is another very traditionally Cornish food. It tended to be baked by the fishermen's wives and one of the people who worked in the fishermen's trade was to stand on the cliff tops looking out for the silvery shoals of pilchards out at sea which were really small silvery fish. Their job was to yell Heather, Heather down to the fishermen and then point them in the direction of where the fish was. When the wives heard the person yelling, Heather, Heather, they knew that there was going to be a good catch of pilchards and so they would set to bake their Heather cake almost straight away as a reward for their husbands when they got home. Heather has over the time been anglicised into heavy cake but the reality is it's not necessarily a heavy cake but it's also not light and fluffy either. It is quite a frugal made cake, so it's made simply with flour, eggs. I've read that it's fat, but I would assume that it's probably lard because it's the cheapest of them, and then some currants. But what makes it different to other cakes throughout the country that are made with similar ingredients is that this has a crisscross pattern cut into the top of it that signifies the fishing net. So I've cut into a slice of the heather cake that I purchased the other day in St. Ives and I'm going to dig in and see what this actually tastes like. That is delicious. It's very, very filling. I don't know, they say it's not a heavy cake. Weight wise it's not, but to eat it, it definitely does feel very heavy. It's not light and fluffy at all. 
And this one, I don't know if it's the most traditional of recipes, but there's definitely some peel of some description in there. I think that's some orange peel and lemon peel. And there's a nice dusting of sugar across the top as well. I can't remember if I said if one of the ingredients was sugar, just to help sweeten it and actually turn it into a cake. But this is really, really delicious. Whilst the cafe here at Kynos Cove was a stunning location for me to try the Cornish pasta, unfortunately, because it is the height of summer and kids' holidays, that cafe was heaving and very, very loud. There were dogs barking, there were kids screaming and people laughing, which is great. Obviously, they're enjoying themselves, but I felt like maybe it'd be best just to come away from the cafe to talk a little bit more about the Cornish pasta. The Cornish pasty does have a geographical protection, so just in the same way that you have things like Parma ham, you can only be called that if it's from that region within Italy, same with things like Champagne, you can only be called that if it's actually made within that Champagne region in northern France. The Cornish pasty has exactly the same protection given to it, so it can only technically speaking be called that if it's made here in Cornwall. Anywhere else, it has to be called something like a steak pasty or a cheese and onion pasty instead. The Cornish pasty dates way, way back in history, and I had heard stories that the miners would take the Cornish pasties down the mine to have at lunch times because their hands got so filthy from all of the mining work that they did, the whole point of the pastry was to actually protect the meat and the potatoes and vegetables inside of it. And instead, they would use the, the pastry shell, almost like a, a spoon to be able to eat the insides, but the pastry would then get thrown away. However, yesterday when we went along to the mining site and went on a tour, we were asking our tour guide about this and he said that that was probably very unlikely to be true. In part because most of the miners were working class, they were very lowly paid and so the idea of wasting any of the food just seemed really stupid and therefore they would actually eat all of the paste in the shell. He did say that sometimes though some miners would get a little bit superstitious and they would just leave one comfort of the pastry for the ghosts that were potentially down the mines. And I suppose if you are working down in those depths in the pitch black, you probably do start to hear things over time and start to believe in those sorts of superstitious ghosts. And so I can understand why they might have left just, just a crimpet, but certainly not the whole of the pastry. The saffron bun is also well known in Cornwall. Now, to me, the ingredients sound very much like a tea cake. So it kind of like a hot cross bun without the cross on the top. So it's a sweeter bread with some dried fruit in there, such as like raisins and sultanas. But what makes this different is that it's traditionally made with saffron. When I was researching it, I was finding out that these days, a lot of places will just add yellow food coloring and they don't actually add the really extra expensive saffron spice to it. And so when we were in St. Ives a few days ago, I was scouting out different shops that were selling them. And I could see these ones that very clearly had saffron as one of the ingredients inside of it. And the price difference between these ones and then other ones where saffron wasn't listed as an ingredient was quite significant. And obviously with saffron being quite expensive, it said to me that these were the genuine kind, which is what I wanted to try. And one half of the bun, I've just buttered it, so I'll try it now. Mm, it definitely has a different taste to just a regular tea cake. And I really like it. I think the saffron is just a it's a very, very light hint that's in there. Now on the other half, our Airbnb host very kindly gave us a jar of honey that she's made herself because in her garden, which you can see behind me, she keeps bees, so she's got beehives, and this is Cornish honey from the bees in her Cornwall back garden, so I couldn't resist putting some on top of a toasted tea cake, so I'll try this one next. I think it's almost just as nice with the honey as what it is with the butter. I had read that another way in which you can eat the saffron buns is by putting <clears throat> Cornish clotted cream on top of them, but because I tried that the other day with the, um, the cream teas, I figured let's try one half with butter, one half with the local, very, very local, like this garden local honey. 
And last but by no means least, the final thing that I'm going to be trying as part of my Cornish food tour is one of these, a furnaces fairings. There's quite a nice story on the side of the box that explains where the fairings came about and when people went and attended the fairs that happened in Cornwall, either on Corpus Christi or at Suntide, they would buy their loved ones fairings such as these or other things such as gingerbreads, candied almonds and take them back for their loved ones or sweethearts. The fairing itself looks very similar to a biscuit or if you guys are stateside Canadian or a cookie. It does smell a little bit a little bit spiced and it's it's solid it, it's not going to be anything that's going to be chewy I don't think I'll tr just dig in try it yes there's definitely some kind of spice that's been put in that but I can't quite put my finger on what it is because I don't think it's cinnamon but it'll be something that's along those lines potentially nutmeg it's got a really really nice crunch the way in which you would expect for a biscuit too it's nice doesn't offend me but I wouldn't say that it's anything necessarily to write home about but naturally because it's Cornish food I wanted to try some